Feast like a king, they say. But have you ever wondered how exactly did the great King Henry VIII feast? This monarch's reign marked a time of grand banquets and decadent dishes. Today, we're going on a culinary journey back to the Tudor era, exploring the royal recipes of that time. Before we continue, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more culinary journeys back in time. We take pride in recreating and sharing the authentic tastes of history, from the grand feasts of monarchs to the humble meals of peasants. Whether you're a foodie, a history buff, or just curious, you're in for a treat. So, if you haven't already, click that subscribe button and let's dive into the Tudor kitchen together. We promise you a feast for the senses and a taste of a bygone era. Now let's step back in time and explore the heart of a Tudor home, the kitchen. Imagine stepping into a Tudor kitchen, bustling with life and filled with the scent of exotic spices. As we step back in time, let's picture the heart of a Tudor home, the kitchen. This space is alive with activity. The air is thick with the aroma of wood smoke from the open hearth, mingling with the heady scent of herbs and spices. There's a large oak table dominating the room, laden with an array of ingredients, some familiar, others less so. In a Tudor kitchen, the cooking methods are as varied as they are ingenious. There's the open hearth, the culinary stage where the magic happens. Here, sturdy iron pots hang from hooks, bubbling away with stews and broths. Nearby, a spit turner, usually a young boy, tirelessly turns a handle, ensuring roasting meats are cooked evenly. Baking is done in a separate oven, heated by burning wood until the stones reach the right temperature. The embers are then swept out, and loaves of bread are placed inside to bake in the residual heat. It's a delicate process, requiring skill and a keen sense of timing. Now let's turn our attention to the ingredients. In the Tudor era, food is a symbol of wealth and status. The rich feast on meats like venison, swan, and peacock, while the poor make do with mutton, pork, and beef. Exotic spices such as nutmeg, cinnamon, and cloves are a luxury, used sparingly to enhance the flavors of dishes. Vegetables, on the other hand, are considered peasant food, often shunned by the nobility. Despite this, a variety of vegetables including cabbages, onions, and leeks would have been grown in the kitchen garden, providing sustenance and variety to the Tudor diet. Fruits like apples, pears, and plums are preserved in honey or sugar and enjoyed as sweet treats. Honey is also used as a sweetener in a variety of dishes, as sugar is still a rare and expensive commodity. Armed with this knowledge, we're ready to dive into the first recipe, fit for a king himself. Our first royal feast dish is a classic Tudor pie, a favorite at King Henry's banquets. Let's delve into the intricacies of this culinary delight. Now, the Tudor pie wasn't any ordinary pie, it was a symbol of abundance, a dish that showcased the host's wealth and generosity. The pie was often large, filled to the brim with various meats and spices and baked in a sturdy thick crust. The ingredients for a Tudor pie are as fascinating as the pie itself. A typical pie would feature a medley of meats, chicken, beef, maybe even game meats like venison. The meats would be seasoned with a variety of spices, cloves, mace, nutmeg, and saffron to name a few. These were expensive imports in the Tudor era, adding to the pie's luxurious reputation. But what would a pie be without its crust? The Tudors preferred a hard, durable crust, often referred to as a coffin. This wasn't just a container for the filling, but a baking vessel in itself. The preparation of the pie was a meticulous process. The meats were first seasoned and marinated, then layered into the crust with dried fruits and additional spices. The pie was then sealed and baked until golden brown. A fun fact about the Tudor pie is that it was sometimes baked with live birds inside. During the banquet, when the pie was cut open the birds would fly out, much to the delight and surprise of the guests. This was a show of opulence and entertainment that only the wealthiest could afford. The Tudor pie, with its rich ingredients and extravagant presentation, was more than just a dish. It was a statement, a spectacle, a testament to the lavish lifestyle of the Tudor court. And that's how you make a Tudor pie, a dish that has graced many royal banquets. Next on our menu is marchpane, a sweet delight that was often served at Tudor feasts. Let's delve into the making of this Tudor-era delicacy. Marchpane, known today as marzipan, was a luxurious sweet treat enjoyed by the Tudor nobility. It was often shaped into intricate designs painted with edible colors and presented as a centerpiece at grand feasts. The basic ingredients of marchpane are simple, almonds, sugar, and rose water. The almonds are ground into a fine powder, which is then mixed with sugar to create a sweet, nutty paste. Rose water, a common flavoring in Tudor-era confections, is then added to the mix, giving it a delicate floral note. 
To make marchpane you start by blending the ground almonds and sugar together. The rose water is then added gradually, until you end up with a dough-like consistency. This mixture is then kneaded until smooth and rolled out flat. Traditionally a round or oval shape was preferred, but feel free to get creative with your designs. Once you've rolled out your marchpane it's time for baking. The Tudors would have baked it in a slow oven until it was dry and firm to the touch. A glaze made from egg whites and rose water was then applied to give it a shiny finish. Now the fun part, decoration. The march pane would be adorned with comfits, dried fruits or even gold leaf to make it as visually appealing as it was delicious. Historically, march pane was more than just a dessert. It was a symbol of wealth and prestige, a display of culinary artistry, and a testament to the extravagance of Tudor feasts. From the painstaking preparation to the elaborate presentation, every aspect of march pane was designed to impress. With that you now know how to make march pane, a dessert that sweetened many a royal palate. Get creative with your shaping and decorating and you'll have a dish that's fit for a king, or in this case a tutor. Last but not least we have pottage, a hearty dish that was a staple in the tutor diet. Let's unravel the simplicity and the allure of this dish, shall we? Pottage, a humble yet nourishing concoction was essentially a thick soup or stew. It was a versatile dish that could be adapted to the available ingredients. The base usually consisted of a grain like barley or oats, and was simmered in a pot for a long period until it reached a porridge-like consistency. In the Tudor period, pottage was often enriched with whatever vegetables were in season. Onions, leeks and cabbage were common, but so were root vegetables like carrots and parsnips. Peas and beans added protein and substance to the dish. The wealthier classes would have added meat to their pottage, making it a richer dish and a symbol of their status. The meat, typically mutton or beef, was boiled until tender and then shredded into the pottage. But the true character of the pottage lay in its seasoning. The Tudors were fond of strong flavors and would have used a variety of herbs and spices. Parsley, sage and thyme were popular, as were exotic spices like cloves and mace, which were a sign of wealth and extravagance. Now, the significance of pottage in the Tudor era cannot be understated. This dish was a daily staple, consumed by all, from the wealthiest nobles to the humblest peasants. It was a dish that was easily adaptable, economical, and nourishing, making it an essential part of the Tudor diet. In essence pottage illustrates the resourcefulness and adaptability of the Tudor cooks. It reflects the seasonal and local approach to food that was the norm in those days. It's a dish that embodies the spirit of the Tudor era, a time of exploration and discovery but also of hardship and survival. And that concludes our Tudor recipe collection, a culinary journey through time. So the next time you sit down for a meal, remember that you're not just eating food, you're partaking in a rich and fascinating history. We've traveled back in time and feasted like kings, but the journey doesn't have to end here. There are so many more sumptuous Tudor-era recipes waiting to be explored and savored. We invite you to join us on this culinary adventure. Like our videos to show your support. Subscribe to our channel to ensure you don't miss out on any future gastronomic time travels. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on these historical delicacies. Have you tried recreating any of these dishes? How did they turn out? Do you have any Tudor-era recipes of your own to share? So, what are you waiting for? Subscribe, join the conversation, and let's keep the feast going. Until next time, happy cooking!